but I'll call you out. All right, we'll get started. We'll open up the budget hearing for May 30th, 2023. The agenda I have is the mayor, treasurer, assessor, auditor, tax collector, and then police department. Uh, here in the chamber is Councilor McGivern, Councilor Anderson Burgos, Councilor Vaking, Councilor Jordan. Online is Councilor Puello, Councilor Bartley, and Councilor Jenny Rivera is on her way. She just sent me a text. Uh, with that, we'll call in the mayor and everyone else if they want to come in and take a seat, get comfortable. What we normally do is go right down in order, have the mayor start <coughs> off, and then I'll turn it over to the counselors if they want to go to a certain department that's listed here for tonight. We'll go to that page and if there's a certain line item, just give the number and then we'll go from there. Um, the next budget hearing, just for those who are at home, uh, is June 12th and then June 13th, both at 6 uh, p.m. and then June 26th would be the vote by the council on the budget. So with that, turn over to the mayor. Just a, a question uh, I could, Mr. Sure. President. Council. What recap sheet are we using and are we gonna go through that first? Yeah, that'll be the mayor and Tanya. Tanya's back there, so. Do you have that or? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Actually, and, uh, you can't spend money if you don't have money. Actually, that's what, it, so counselors, I. Just like last year where we had Andrea from Kinsherv present the recap with the auditor, go over the revenue and uh, over the, 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 dra the forecast model, it didn't dawn on me to have that ready for, the, for this meeting and just before the meeting starting, I spoke to the president here and asked if whether or not you want me to prepare that for the next hearing and I can certainly yep. make sure that we have that available. So. All right. Councilor McGivern, anything else? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Todd, I had one thing. Uh, Councilor Jordan. Yeah, in turn, uh, I was going to ask Tanya, could she send around the most recent um, <clears throat> report with all the transfers um, through whatever the most recent month we would have that completed on so we can see what mo more money's in and out of the different departments? So I don't know if uh, maybe through April 30th, <clears throat> that, if that would be available yet. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Does somebody have the recap? If I can go through it if somebody has a copy of it. I, I have a copy. Can I have that, please? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I didn't even think to bring it. Thank you so much. And Councillor Murphy Rambaletti is also here. So with that, first turn over to the mayor, and then if we need to, we'll go over to Tanya. <laughs> So the budget you'll be reviewing between now and the next couple budget hearings, um, I, I, I put it in a form of an exercise. I think an exercise is the right term because exercise is important it is. We don't, we don't like to do it because uh, it's stressful. Uh, the budget in front of you um, is one uh, that's conservative. Uh, we're still behind with revenues um, and understanding what our revenue position is as far as what the next um, fiscal year is gonna look like. Uh, and although there's a lot of work happening in the treasurer's office, both together with our auditor, um, from the support of this council, uh, hiring a consultant that's, that's really helped out the department, um, not only that department, but also um, has been advising and guiding um, uh, the tax collector's office and trying to understand how do we streamline services between the departments and so forth. Um, we'll know more what our revenue position is as we get to the end of the calendar year before we set the tax rate. So because of that, um, again, just like I did last year, um, I did a lot of cutting and it was painful. It wasn't a, a easy task, uh, but a necessary one. And so um, you're gonna notice as we go through this, um, yeah, we have the contractual obligations, which we honored uh, in the budget, uh, but those uh, that are in Schedule A, we have some control over and I didn't choose not to uh, offer a 2% but instead just pause the brakes a little bit and revisit at calendar year end before we set the tax rate. Um, same with filling in empty positions um, or even adding new positions and new positions that are being added um, in this budget which are two of them were just 
strategic moves to better help our um, position and how we're managing. Um, uh, with that said, in the mayor's version of the budget, you'll notice the CAFO position um, line item um, of 125000 and then the other new thing, well, new for this administration, but not new from previous administrations, um, is a dollar amount for the uh, public slash dignitary receptions. Um, and I'm fine if, if you cut that completely, um, but just, I'd be happy to answer questions on that if, if you want. Uh, but the one more important in the mayor's version of the budget to me is that CAFO position. Everything else is the same. With that, be happy to, and, and I'll be here at every budget hearing next to the departments to go over anything I might have cut to explain why or what the strategy might be to navigate that particular, what that line item does and so forth. All right, any questions for the mayor on, on his page, page two? Uh, Councilor Reagan. Thank you, Mr. President. So welcome, Mayor, and um, I appreciate your conservative approach on the revenues, and hopefully you'll be rewarded with better ones as we go forward. Um, could you help us out a little bit with fleshing out this, um, how you would see the Chief Financial Administrative Officer working? <coughs> we, I'm just, so far haven't seen any outlines relative to the position, and I'm wondering how you see it fitting in with the current structure? Do you see it as an add-on? Mm -hmm. um, just curious. Where are, Tanya, where are we with, I know we talked about either going with something that's already reflected in the Schedule A or bringing, proposing to add to the Schedule A? I believe they created a um, job description and we're gonna submit it to ordinance. So that, the job description should be coming to you soon, Counselor. Um, but as far as having this position available within our existing structure, really all, all it is is it's uh, the oversight of the financial internal controls and also navigating um, year-end processes and uh, closing out deficits and grant oversight uh, reporting, you know, it's mostly that day-to-day -day internal minutia that the mayor and this form of government, our, antiqu our antiquated form of government where the mayor is directly responsible for all of that, will be delegating those tasks. The mayor will still be in control, um, uh, but instead uh, the day-to-day uh, -day internal uh, tasks would be over facilitated by, by a CAFO, and the reason for that um, I like to think I'm a smart guy. I, 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 I did come in with a level of experience and it's helped me a lot. Um, there's certainly so much more that can be done without being so heavily dependent on our auditor being both to some extent a CFO and the auditor. Um, uh, and also that's much more knowledgeable with municipal finance, mass general laws um, than I am. The biggest thing here is the continuity. It's when whoever the next mayor is and cross administration between mayors and councils, that we have a manager internally that's able to help the decision makers make informed decisions rather than short sighted when we're making certain investments, making sure we're not, you know, doing na navigating the legalities um, of the decisions we're making and, and so forth. So, so, that's so if I could just follow up through the president. Yeah, sure. Um, so it sounds like. You're indicating auditors have been doing this work so far, or in the last few years. I think we, it's a it's a combination of between the the mayor's office and the auditor. I can't speak to the former mayor, mm -hmm. um, but coming in, I notice how much the auditor does, um, and it's been a, a great to. And you know, I'm not going to put words in Tanya's mouth, but because of what I know. It works well for that legislative check executive balance where I mean you know the budget process is not entirely on 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 her that I, oh 
I'm sorry, I don't think I was clear. I meant oh, the sorry. outside auditor. If the outside auditor was doing some of these functions relative to the oh. oversight that you were referring to, I, I didn't mean our auditor, but maybe it's both. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I mean, maybe auditor, it's both, the right? Accountant. <laughs> Tanya? I want to say that our outside auditors are not doing this type of work, but if we did have a position in this capacity, I think it would allow for me to be able to do more auditing and also be able to file our own state documentation so it would be more timely. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, the key thing for this position is just, again, it's, it's, it's strengthening that oversight <coughs> of how finances are getting moved around, how we're prioritizing. A CAFO knows how to maintain a capital budget, knows how to manage and maintain a financial forecast model, um, is ensuring accountability across the boards when it comes to internal controls. It's, it's a much more um, sophisticated uh, oversight position. Thank you. Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, much of this discussion, I think, is going to take place in ordinance committee or Perhaps it should be charter and rules because I can't see this position being created without a charter change, especially to the treasurer's office, and without at least some attention paid to the appointments by the city council of our chief assessor, assessor, and auditor, you know, themselves. Um, I'm not against the position, but the salary you're asking for, Mr. Mayor, is greater than the salary of the current mayor as you know, and, and I understand probably justified in the world of finance and the type of uh, caliber and experience right. that you want to bring into this position. Right. But how does a chief financial officer oversee three or four departments which are not all under the direct appointment control of the mayor? And, and I'm asking this in yep. how do you justify a salary and still have a mayor paid the same salary to do the same job. So the, the, the position of the CAFO, again, the salary reflects, like you pointed out, the caliber of the, of the person with that, the skill. And I want to get the best person in Massachusetts. 125 might not get me the best person, but someone, someone good. Uh, and it'll be no different than how it's being managed right now. I have no direct power or control over the treasurer or the the, the assessor or the tax collector or whatever the case, but I facilitate an office of collaboration and coordination. We work very well together, um, and it's my expectation that a CAFO wouldn't, would, would operate the same way. Um, this isn't anything unique to our city. It's been recommended by the DLS into three different, three or two or three, three different financial management reviews they've offered to the city of Holyoke, and I know there's some work that this body is working on around whether or not we should change the position of treasurer from a elected to appointed and officially consolidating. There's a lot of sh charter structural changes that it's going to take much more time to work on. Um, but, uh, you know, right now as it exists, the busiest time of the year is tax rate setting. Um, it's year end budget process. Um, and getting ready for that transition into the new fiscal year. And so the focus, knowing that I have to meet with departments, there's these day-to-day -day obligations that I have as mayor, while also trying to keep up with all the requests of the community that want the mayor's attention all the time. So, it, and that's my, that's fine. Like I can, that's me right now. I can navigate in that environment and you know, it certainly is a lot of time, but you know, I'm more worried about, um, and, and from what I've heard, there's been a lot of work in the past to catch up and then we go backwards when there's turnover. That's what I'm worried about, that we put in all this time to really get things moving in the right direction and then transition happens for whatever reason and all that time wasted, we go backwards. And so anyway, straight to answer your question, Councillor, yeah, it, it wouldn't be operating no different than how we're managing now, except we'll be bringing on someone with much more caliber and experience and knowledge and uh, coordination than, than what we're already doing right now. I, I understand, and, yep. and believe me, Mayor, I, you're doing a great job in all those areas, and, and I think that's important, but my 
point from a budget review is we have to justify two top salaries for essentially doing the same responsibility. And now, does that weaken, you know, the way our government is set up? You know, and, and I, I'm not opposed to changing the way government is set up, but until we change the treasurer, the auditor, tax collector, assessors, the way we appoint, the way we do business, I, I think it's a far bigger debate than just creating a position because we need it. Um, unless you are thinking that maybe the mayor can just be ceremonial from this point on. <laughs> hey, if, well, however you guys want to change the charter. Um, it'll be more delegating the responsibilities of that level of oversight, internal controls to the CAFO that it, the mayor currently has. Um, the, the key word is oversight. That's not the way it's done now. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a big difference. But... That debate will be for ordinance committee. I was trying to follow, Councillor. I'm sorry. What's how are you defining oversight? Well, oversight is is the responsibility of what is the responsibility of our tax collector, our assessors, and our auditor. And how do you do oversight if you're not responsible for those individual positions? You know, there's an argument where the mayor is. Because the mayor is responsible for all appropriations, the mayor is responsible for all government, and we set up carefully set up ways to define that in terms of appointing. Fortunately, very rare issues of discipline and or corrective action that's necessary you know, on a personnel level, but now you're adding another position to it at a salary that's greater than the mayor's salary, and that's what I'm trying to justify. The mayor's salary is, I, I wouldn't even come here and ever ask for an increase. I mean, the mayor's salary, there's been arguments where like people will say the mayor should make more than the highest paid employee, and I disagree with that. The, the salaries reflect the skill and talent that you're essentially contracting with to execute duties and responsibilities. The mayor is an elected position. I mean, I wouldn't want my dentist to be an elected position. You know what I mean? If you're not, if you don't, if you've never done it before, it's a huge learning curve, which means, and that's the city of Holyoke. That's our revolving door right there. That's why we go backwards all the time. And we're not, we can, you, you know, you get people to come in and they, they, they do their best. They mean very well, but in, in that process, you know, sometimes you know, there's missteps, um, and those get expensive. It could affect, it could affect the tax rate. Um, I, what it, what the CAFO, and and we can continue our mayoral form, council form of government. And Springfield, they have a comptroller, TJ Plant, um, responsible directly to the mayor. And uh, essentially, the comptroller, the mayor, doesn't make a decision unless until the comptroller comes forward with. It's an experienced, qualified person that knows municipal management and finance. Sarno can leave next week in the form of the city government. Continuity continues. Contracts are still being honored. Procurement laws are still being followed or making sure that they're still being followed. You know, uh, things are being reconciliated. Like, those requirements continue. Um, while we transition and getting used to that, that new practice while we transition into what our future essentially would look like, assuming that there's an appetite um, from the council and the community to want to start changing some of our, um, you know, how, it, how, how we practice and how it reflects compared to our, you know, charter. That's the thought process in, a nut, in the grand scheme of it. Um, I'm thinking long term, uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I want to work with you guys as much as I can to learn as much as possible. So that you don't make, so that none of us make a short-sighted decision, because I wouldn't want you to agree to something that is going to be a waste or it's going to break. Um, so I, I'm with you. I'm not completely discounting what you're saying. I'm just trying to start a conversation about a, a, a new future for the city of Holyoke and how we operate, which is a necessary conversation. And I do commend you for that, and I just think it's, from a budgetary point of view, it might be a little premature, but. You got to start somewhere. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Yeah, uh, welcome Mayor and, and others. Um, somewhat along the lines of where Councilor McGivern was asking, I just wanted to understand, is the money here with the hope that 
you're putting in here as a placeholder on the view that we're going to figure these issues out over the but you're not going to fill the position until we go through all the mechanics of all this right like the treasurer does this and the auditor does that and we get this all in the rules and if we have to change something because i'm very warm to your idea of doing the cafo it's just um i figured you know we're going to have this process and we're going to figure this all out together and then change these rules and then and then at that point you're going to put out a posting and try and get good candidates and and i was viewing this in the budget as a placeholder now if I'm if my assumptions are wrong and you're like okay July first I'm I, posting the job I mean my hands are tied until you guys accept um, have it reflected in the schedule A so okay I wouldn't be able to start or hire anybody until okay. this body has accepted that as far as the 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 oversight responsibility and and you'll talk about an ordinance and you'll see the 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 uh, description there. The person's not going to have control and oversight control of any. You can't. It's you know, charter keeps those departments all right separate. Um, but the CAFO instead will be essentially delegating the tasks that the mayor does. Um, things that I'm doing now, but much more, much more smarter and better and sophisticated than what I can do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always going to be my expectation to be sure that no different than what we do now, that cross collaboration, working together, that we're sticking with the, the tasks we put in front of us as we go through a fiscal year, month to month. Um, so that, you know, while at the same time, this body continues to work on, you know, what changes we want to make, what our future is going to look like, but. This person is not going to be bossing these folks around, um, but instead um, pushing those conversations forward to be sure that we're implementing the best best practices um, to manage resources and avoid liability to the ratepayers. Do you have a reasonable goal of how long you think this process should be? Obviously, you're looking at 125 if the person started on July 1st, and as you know, you know we're always got our red pencils out here to, to find a dollar. Do, do you feel or are estimating this could take six months if we try and put our mind to it? Like the goal is, you know, let's get this figured out by January 1st or, or what have you. This way we could say, look, you know, we'll leave half the money in because our goal is that halfway through the fiscal year, you know, the money is allocated and put to the side and saved and in the budget. And this way, you know, the council and working with you has this time to figure it out together, and then we sort of take it from there. Uh, do, do you have any insights for us on that? Or because I'm, I'm assuming this is—I mean, you and I have talked, and this is an important priority for you. And you know, I, I know I'm sure our committees will try and get on this as quick as we can. I think we can achieve our our outcome as as quickly as we can achieve consensus. Um, so that can be three months, six months. It could be a whole year. Um, okay. I, but, you know, certainly it's, a com it's definitely a conversation starter. Um, if, if, you know, we can revisit at the ca at calendar year end when we're doing our, when there'll be a supplemental with pluses and minuses in the budget, we start moving things around. Um, I don't want to lose sight of it either. Um, right. You know what I mean? So there's flexibility here. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, we can um, still, you know, act aggressively um, so that, you know, we can better protect what we're trying to, you know, manage here okay. for the city. So to your answer, yeah, there's, there's flexibility there to, I mean, you know, do you want to cut it in half? We can revisit or fund. Maybe we can have a January 1. Right. Um, start date as a target. There's there's definitely a lot of room there. And which I'm glad you brought up the point about the supplemental budget. I think that's your intention at this point, right? You're sort of the vision here. And again, this is sort of unique to your style. And we haven't seen We're, this in prior mayors is they tend to do this as a one shot deal. Yeah, no. Whereas you're sort of uh, the masterpiece is on the canvas. And this is you're going out the door with what you know at this time, and then you supplement it later. And it sounds like that's your approach again this year. It's 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 not my 
favorite process, but it's one to help us keep the, the plane flying. Um, uh, you know, uh, as we go forward and, and, and our local government resources becomes healthier and healthier, you know, we'll get to a point where we can effectively, we can budget and then do transfers here and there a few times. Right now, we use it as a strategy to keep the rates low and so that we're not breaking the bank. And at the same time, we're building up capacity. And I think in time, you're going to see more money being collected. You'll see um, uh, uh, new growth. Um, that belt will loosen up a little more. We'll have much more flexibility to not have to depend on that process. Um, the supplemental, though, it 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 slows us down and it helps us and it, it you know cuts are they're, they're I don't it's not my favorite budget cut there are cuts that w that were made that we're going to have to revisit later mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that the idea would be as just before we hit that tax rate things that were funded that didn't come to fruition that weren't necessary maybe it was a series of open positions that didn't get filled that we can cut um, uh, and then other things that we can add that we might have cut that we want to put back in. Maybe it's that, you know, you'll hear from some departments of some positions that I that that were open that I cut or they add, wanted to add that I cut. Um, maybe revisit those and put it back. Either way, it's it's meant to give us some more time to get our revenue in control. Um, uh, from what was reported to me by our auditor is that the number she gave me. The revenues are going to be much stronger than anticipated, and that was purposely done by design because, again, this is the exercise. Um, and so that way, when you set the tax rate, you know, it's if there is an increase, it's it's one that's that is palatable. It's not anything substantial. Um, that's the that's the exercise um, that I was referring to earlier on when I started the conversation here. That you know. Exercising is healthy, but none of us like to do it. Um, but certainly en enough to get us through, get us through um, the budget, get us through setting the tax rate, and then on to the, the next fiscal year. Changing gears, I saw you had a new line this year, public and dignitary receptions. Uh, you put 1500 in there. W what did you have in mind there, Mayor? Yeah, so that was one that was funded in the past much much more than that um i zeroed it out um uh, you know there has been things that would happen whether if it's hosting here at city hall people visiting people visiting from other countries from uh other cities and towns uh, other communities um where you know we got creative either i i do a, a potluck or something or i'll just spend my own money and not seek reimbursement and so that's when I said, you know, maybe this line item is would be helpful. Um, it's a, it's a modest one. I probably that's probably more than what I what I need. Um, then again, you know, that's why I kind of put that there so that you know it looks good. It's a good reflection on us when we can properly host uh, people yep. that come to the city and, and take care of lunch or whatever the case may be, a, a dinner um, at, in the mayor's office, whatever. Sure. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone online? Seeing none. Um, we can go just next would be page three would be the auditor. Any questions for the auditor? Uh, let's see. There was a drop in professional accounting um, and auditing from the prior year. Is there a savings there? Uh, um, what that savings is, is it is the Siegel actuarial reports. They only do the, um, the larger reports every two years, so in between it's only $4,500. Okay. All right. Great. Next. Mike. We can always come back, so, but Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Mr. Resident. Okay. Um, through the chair, through the auditor. Tanya, um, you, I think we, we all work close with uh, you and your office and understand that you've uh, made some uh, internal changes over the last, last couple of years since 
a little bit since the last budget, but more so before that. Is this budget reflect what you need to perform the duties of the auditor? And is it short your request or something that you can live with in terms of, uh, from a budget point of view? No, this is definitely something I can live with. I would like my accountant to get a raise, don't get me wrong, because she fills in and she's super helpful and overqualified. But I'm sure, you know, she'd be willing to stay with us with, with her salary the way that it is. Thank you. All right. Um, page five would be the assessor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. New principal clerk position. No, you yeah, hit the, turn it on. Should light up. All right, that's moving our floating clerk to a principal clerk. It's the same grade, same pay. Oh. She's she just has never floated. Oh. So I wanted to take her out of that category. And oh, I see. Put her into okay. personal clerk. Okay. And sick leave buyback five thousand. You are you anticipating a retirement or? Um. Well, I've been there twenty years this year, and another person in my office has been there that long. So I want to have the money there in case someone leaves. Is there, are we anticipating somebody leaving? I don't anticipate it right now, but if someone did, I would need to have it in the budget. No, I know, but then we just make a transfer from wherever to, to fund that. I was just wondering if there's... That would, that would be fine with me as long as that gets covered if of course yeah I mean that's a that's a con that's something contract. that we're required the 20 percent up to 5,000 rule on those so we would have to pay for it it's just the quite you know again it, you know Deb as we're doing this it's fund it if we need to fund it but don't fund it if we don't need to fund it but if we okay. do then we'll give it to you you know well I didn't put it in my budget last year because I wasn't sure exactly how it worked but when I came to this year and realized we have two people at 20 years, anything can happen. I figured I should okay. put it in. But if that's the way it works, that's fine if we yeah. were to get rid of that. I think the, I think the mayor wants it. I, I mean, obviously, if you're usually like with the police, they make a, okay, they get some sort of letter of intent or they get a sense from the, the, the police officers if they're gonna retire, but if they're not, then you know we do our best guesstimate. So uh, I don't know, Mayor, you wanted to weigh in? No. It, I think I might have missed this one. Is this an open position? No. No, this is the sick leave buyback sick leave would buyback. be if we're doing a retirement, you're allowed up 20% of your sick leave up to 5,000 for a city hall employee. So oh. that's what made me ask. It sounds like they're putting five grand aside. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so 51510. Yeah. Like we didn't put it in this year's budget, but. As I said, I wasn't sure how that worked. Sure. But I figured since we had long-term employees, I should put it in there to cover it. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if someone's retiring, definitely, yeah. But you would be okay if we were to cut it, provided we give it back to you if somebody does retire? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just, sorry, I was just talking to the auditor. We missed that one. I, you're okay? I'm okay with cutting yeah, that out as long as it comes back if it's needed. That's of course. It. We have to give it to you. It wouldn't yeah. be a choice. We would have to give it to you if that's okay. the case. Yeah. Okay. Councilor McGivern. Doesn't mean we have to let you retire at all. <laughs> <laughs> you better not. We need you. <laughs> Did we just on the, the professional uh, assessment services, I think money was transferred in that line item <laughs> this year. Excuse me? The, prof the line item <coughs> under expenses, professional assessment services, mm -hmm. the, there was some money transferred into that account this year? Um, there wasn't money transferred into it. We, we spent money from it. And then, but there is an increase in your request this year that the mayor didn't allow? There is. The increase for my request was cut. <laughs> I had requested 
I requested 83,750 to account for 17,750 for our annual interim adjustment and miscellaneous services support that we have every year. I also calculated for the billing and calculation of the tax bills at 3,000. And in order to receive our recertification from the state because 2025 is our five year period from the state, we have to have commercial and industrial properties reinspected and we need help with those. And I put 18,000 in there for that. Um, and then I put 45,000 in for legal services and appraisal of the mall. How much? Which okay. we didn't need. 45,000 I put for legal services and mall appraisal. 45, okay. And it was cut to 25. If it comes down to the supplemental budget, I'm probably going to hopefully get some money to cover the cyclical inspections so that we will receive our state certification. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Jordan. Yeah, um, Deb, yep. about the, the mall one, as you know, mm -hmm. it was kind of on mm -hmm. a one trick pony over here talking about, you know, the mall and how we've obviously watched the tax bill go from eight million down to four mm -hmm. million, and you know, obviously that's a huge impact to us. And making sure you have the tools you need to evaluate all this—it's a very highly specialized area, and I know you do the best you can with it. But the question is, bringing in some, some support on some of these abatements, and I got to assume they're going to keep going, knowing the national market on malls and the state of affairs of malls throughout the country, and. Um, we're all watching that and obviously that has a big impact on our commercial base. So the question is, do you think it's um, a good idea this year to take a look at all this? Do you anticipate there'll be another round of these um, abatement requests potentially from them? Um, what, what's there, there could be possibly. Yeah. Um, I think we benefited greatly by the mall hiring an appraiser and having the appraisal done and paying for it themselves. Just because the mall paid for the appraisal doesn't mean it was geared towards them. An appraisal has to be done without bias. That appraisal was. That appraisal covered everything from income, expense, mall rent rolls, cap rates, COVID features. It covered everything in depth. And... I don't feel we needed to hire a separate appraiser to perform another appraisal on the mall. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty adept at reading appraisal reports because every year or every two years, the Mass Assessors Association makes assessors take um, USPAP course, which is Uniform Standards of Practice Appraisal Report, which teaches us how to read appraisals, what's included, what's not, what we, what's acceptable. Um, so we have a pretty good idea of what it is. And I don't think we need to build up funds for doing appraisals for businesses. Values are, or on any tax bill, whether it's residential or commercial, the onus is on the taxpayer to prove to us our values are wrong. So I, we're not in the market to go out and get appraisals for everybody. So I don't right. think it was wise for us to do that. Okay. So, as you know, this isn't everybody, right? Because we only have so many $8 million a, a year uh, taxpayers. Right. Um, right. That's a pretty short list of one. Yes. And um, I was thinking, you know, on that one, obviously they're hiring somebody. They're probably going through that meticulously before they ever file it and release it to you. And they're going back and forth with that. I'm just wondering, you know, they're probably not going to come back with an appraisal that says, oh, geez, you know, we really did a lot of research on this. As a matter of fact, we're underpaying you the taxes. You know, we, we, we should actually be paying you more. I, I wonder, like, you know, it's like the, the abatement doesn't even get filed unless it's requesting a significant reduction. And I guess 
I like the fact that they did that big body of work. I'm just wondering, do you need someone for 5,000 or 10,000 on something so valuable to us to assist you in reviewing that, reviewing those records saying, you know what, well, yes, there's this, but there's also this case over here from wherever and this case from over here and there's this mall, this mall, this mall type of situation to give you because like, I mean, how, it seems yeah. like a lot to put on you to, to have to have that type of body of information. I'm just wondering if we're doing enough to support you. That's, that's what I'm concerned about. Well, right now I'm not complaining. Um, I, we do have our association, which I lean on heavily for support, networking with them, talking to other assessors, and even other appraisers at events and things I go to. That all helps. And our Mayflower Valuations, who helps us do our interim adjustments and miscellaneous services, and Patriot, both weigh in with us. Oh, they do help you? Yes. Okay. So okay. we do have professionals helping us along the way and working with us and giving us suggestions. Okay. So I do feel I don't need the help and it's all fair, but it's very nice to know if I did, I can give yeah. a little shout out and get some oh, help. Oh, please, yeah, please let us know because, you know, this this stuff is huge, you know, uh, some of these these really big ones to make sure you know, you're you're getting the support that you need to to, yes. to fight the good fight, you know, yep. for us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Deb. You're welcome. Thank you. Seeing no one else. To next would be treasurer, which would be six and seven. Todd, unless somebody else. Okay. Okay. So, uh, new deputy treasurer position, Rory. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Similar to uh, what Deb was saying in her office, currently we have a floater that really doesn't fulfill that uh, role. Um, she's really taken on a lot more. So I'd like to um, be able to move her into the deputy position. Um, I did keep. Um, the floating clerk line. Uh, now that clerk um, is one that is actually hired between the tax collector and the treasurer uh, to help out. Um, I've spoken with the tax collector and if this position were to be funded, uh, we have a plan um, in place to actually utilize that floating position appropriately between both offices. Um, and it would help, um, that position would help not only um, deal with the public as they come in um, to be able to take tax payments, um, they would also help uh, with cash receipts, uh, which is something that you know we could use more assistance in both receiving and processing those receipts so that they can be turned over on a much more timely basis to the auditor. Um, so that's why. Um, you see those two positions. In Be between the two offices, though, it is a net one more position, though, correct? Correct. Okay. And it's because of the workload and we just need the extra position? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely because of the workload. Uh, if you think of the functions of the treasurer's office, um, one of the main functions of that office uh, right now has to do with payroll. And the way our office is currently situated, um, the front counter, which I'm sure all the counselors here and, and anybody in the public, uh, people that work in the city come to, <clears throat> the two folks that are there primarily are dealing with payroll um, and accounts payable. Um, and the payroll process doesn't just start during the week of, of pay week. Um, it really is every single day um, over the 14 week pay period, work is being done. Um, we're processing <coughs> a role on behalf of the city, the schools and the gas and electric. Um, so that work, folks coming in, um, needing to be able to deal with that. And then at the same time, 
somebody comes in with a cash deposit, somebody comes in and wants to pay a tax title uh, payment, somebody wants to come in and ask a question, then we have to send them actually physically out the door, down the hall, around the corner to the tax collector's office um, to be able to do the business there. Uh, we have a bit of a plan in place that would both make the payroll function and the AP function more efficient, um, while at the same time uh, process payments that are coming in from the general public and turnovers uh, and cash receipts um, from city departments. So you feel that by adding this position, um, going from four to five in the, in the department, issues that like we've had and have been identified as problems, you know, our IRS fines and all that good stuff, which is usually centered around payroll problems yep. or getting stuff in that this is going to contribute to us. Absolutely. Taking care of those type of issues. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, in light of the added position, I see you also put in a thousand for overtime. Was there a reason that you think you're still going to have overtime in light of the new position? Well, I, I would say that if if we were to have that position, we could maybe forego that thousand dollars in overtime. The reason I placed that in there is really um, right now. I know that our personnel office, and and when you have Kelly in here, I'm sure. She'll talk more about what's happening in her office. One of the things that's happening citywide, and I'm all in favor for it, is having uniform policies uh, around certain things like comp time, overtime, um, the way that folks, uh, you know, perform their duties. If it's a Friday afternoon, and this is not a hypothetical, this has happened more than once, um, I have two union employees. They are due overtime. Um, I don't have a budget to pay them. So the only solution that I have uh, in front of me right now um, would be to either offer some kind of loose comp time, uh, which is something the city's trying to move away from. And again, I'm all in favor of that. We should have uniform policies throughout. But I've had situations where my union employees have had to stay till 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock on a Friday. Um, and the only, or yesterday was a holiday. It's a payroll week. We have new deduction codes because it's the first time of the new uh, health insurance. So one of my union employees had to take their laptop uh, because it's union work. There's certain functions that only they are able to do. They had to log in uh, remotely on a Monday to do this work. The only solution I have to, to compensate them um, is to say, okay, you know, you can punch out a little early on a Friday, or it, it really shouldn't be that way. It should be um, if their contract dictates they're owed overtime, they should be paid overtime. Um, and so that's why I put that request in there. But you think we might be able to avoid that if light of the new position? Certainly, yeah. Okay. Um, Rory, if I could, I'd like to ask you a few questions about some of these uh, expense lines you have. Like, for Absolutely. example, I mean, you requested 120000 for land court expenses. It looks, you know, some years you've spent a little, um, some years more. Here they're starting you off at 40000 What Do you feel comfortable with that number, 40000 Or what, what are your thoughts on that? I feel comfortable in the mayor's strategy. Um, with how he's presented this budget mm -hmm. in that he's taken a very conservative approach with the understanding that as revenue, uh, the picture uh, takes shape and the tax rate setting uh, process, the, the really the second phase of the budget, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the fall, uh, that he would be coming back with a supplemental um, budget. And he has assured me one of those, uh, if everything falls into place, would be an increase in land court expenses because it is certainly something that uh, right now uh, $40,000 for the entire year I don't feel uh, is enough but again I, I have confidence in in the mayor's uh, approach with this um, if uh, you know this is something that helps bring money back into the city um, so the council this past year through a supplemental, uh, invested uh, quite a bit more into that budget line. That's what brought it up to the 115,000 uh, uh, that's listed here as budgeted. 
Um, I would hope that we'd be able to bring it back up something close to that uh, once we get closer to the tax rate being set. Again, it's I understand its approach, but let me ask you this, and I, maybe this is also a question for the mayor. One of the things I would be concerned about is if it's a known expense, mm -hmm. don't you think we should budget <clears throat> for it? Now, if it's something that's a variable expense, something that we're not sure it's going to actually cost that, but if we know it's going to cost more than 40, then why would we want to budget that low on the belief that, well, we'll pick it up down to later because one of the things I get concerned about is with respect to the budget, you hear things like, well, gee, our budget's only 1% more than last year, when in fact we have all this known stuff in the budget that we know darn well, you know, three months from now, we're going to have to backfill in. So, you know, while we're patting all of ourselves collectively on the back that, you know, we, it's 1%. In reality, it actually is going to be a lot more because of things like this. Like, it seems to me if it's a known expense, like if it, well, maybe it could, maybe it could, and we want to leave it out, that makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. right? And we, if we get the revenue and things come in as we're expecting, then we put it in. But if we don't get the money, then that's a variable that we can keep out. But it's sort of like, are we under budgeting in that situation where it's a known expense? and we're just intentionally keeping it low? Like, does that make sense? It, no, it absolutely makes sense. And, and what I will say is, um, you know, certainly the, it, it's the mayor's prerogative. When he and I sat down uh, and we're going through some of these cuts um, and he was struggling with certain things and, you know, I, I fully support this idea of a CAFO. Um, I, I think that now's the time the state has been recommending this since 2007. Um, I don't think there, I, I think we have wonderful people. I, I, in this current position, I've come to respect um, folks I already had respect for, but even more, right? Our auditor, our assessor, our tax collector. Um, the financial team that we have in place right now is, is wonderful. It's wonderful to work with, and I feel that we all have the same goal uh, on where we want to get. But I've also seen those brief uh, moments in time fade away uh, in the past. And so when the mayor says, I can give you this or we can go for the CAFO, I would say, let's take a cut here in order to invest in something that's going to pay dividends for years to come. Because the reality is, is that we should get to a point where our tax title list isn't growing and growing and growing every year. We should have the the personnel, the policies and procedures in place to go after those folks long before they ever make it to uh, land court, mm -hmm. right? And I do feel that a strategic investment like that, uh, which would attract somebody who, from outside the city uh, to come and, and help lead that charge, uh, into the future is is a worthy investment, and I offered up certain cuts uh, out of my budget in order uh, to see that come to fruition. Okay, so that's, with all due respect, that's a little bit of a different answer than your first one. So what you're saying, if I'm listening carefully, is we might not have this expense because if we have the CAFO, they can do various things to... Um, reduce these expenses so that there's a savings there. As opposed to if I was listening carefully to your first answer, it was basically, I think we are going to need this money similar to what we had last year, but you know we're only doing so much. But what you're saying is you think we can make a dent into these expenses with this new CAFO position, which makes all the sense in the world to reduce it then if you think this is truly a variable expense. Well, I think that there's, there's some very simple math here, right? We're talking about land court expenses and legal expenses. If there's not enough money in the budget, we won't be able to um, put any new cases into land court, right? I, right. I, I can't uh, ex expend money that we don't have in the budget. Mm -hmm. So if that is the reality, if, if for a year we have to slow down on certain things mm -hmm. um, in order to introduce a new position uh, that would bring with it some new uh, policies and procedures uh, that would stop that bleeding that got us here to begin with, that makes sense. Um, if if I'm given $40,000, I will make it work. Um, 
the reality is is that re as of today, um, we have, I checked right before I came up, um, 378 um, properties uh, with a tax lien on it. Um, now, how, how many was that, Rory? Uh, 378 active uh, tax liens mm -hmm. as of today. Um, now, that number is going down because of the investments this council and the mayor have made mm -hmm. uh, in that budget line this past year. Uh, just to put it in perspective, six weeks ago, that number was 407. Um, so through our aggressive work, we're able to get that number down. There are certainly things we can do to dr continue to drive that number down outside of land court. But if I were to place all 378 active properties into land court right now, at a minimum, uh, there's a filing fee and $40,000 wouldn't make up. Right. So then what that would mean for my office, if I'm only given the 40,000, is prioritizing. What are the ones that absolutely positively we need to send to land court, that we need to use our outside legal counsel to help uh, us with and what are the other ones that we'll work uh, in-house on and what are the ones that may have to wait for a future fiscal year uh, to deal with. Um, so that's okay. it, it's all part of a, an equation. So it's a little bit different than say an overtime line or an expe a personnel line right. that would be artificially cut uh, with the idea that we know we're going to have to pay this. Right, right, right. This is, this is a line where yes, I would have preferred to have seen the full $120,000, and I would absolutely be putting it to good use on July 1. Um, if the conditions change that allow for that money to come back into this budget, okay. then we will uh, act accordingly. Do you know approximately, using the statistics that you had, of approximately what percentage of the total properties? Is there like about 15,000 properties? So it's like we, do you know what percentage of the properties of the city have a tax lien on them, a ballpark? I, I don't know. Okay. I, 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 I could get you that information, yeah. but I, I, I don't know. Offline, if you could. Yeah, yeah. I'd be Absolutely. curious, is it 2%, 3%? That'd yeah. be interesting. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Vacan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I think this question might be for Rory and Mayor Garcia. I would just like to go back to the new position and the floating clerk for a minute and reference um, a document that we were provided back in 2021 that was looking at combining the collector and treasurer's offices. And at the time, we didn't pursue it because people didn't want to pursue a ballot question during an election year. So I'm a... I thought when we did these floating clerks, it was sort of an idea to have people cross-trained, um, sort of anticipating that we might be doing a consolidation, particularly if we moved into a different structure, but that we were waiting for, for a better timing to pursue it. So it seems like we're kind of separating the collector's office and the treasurer's office, again, into more unique departments by these positions I'm seeing in the budget. So I guess I'm just interested to understand what the thinking is. Sure, so I think that at its core, um, the treasurer's office, and um, I, I, an interesting note uh, that you, you may find interesting, uh, DLS uh, just put out uh, uh, an analysis. They, if you're, I, I don't know, I know I get them Tiny gets and the mayor gets them. These uh, DLS reports, uh, they, it's uh, like their newsletter, right? They send them out. They're very interesting. I, I, I read them uh, as they come in. Um, I was reflecting with uh, Sarah Hunter, who's the consultant the mayor's mentioned, uh, who's been in front of the council, uh, about the 2007 uh, management letter um, that was uh, issued in the, in the, for the treasurer's office and some of its findings and and um, how they were at that time saying, you know, we really should be moving away from it being an elected position. Uh, complete coincidence, but but an hour later, uh, in my email uh, is a DLS uh, uh, analysis about governmental structures, 
And I'm just flipping through, and I was like, okay, you know, I've read this before, and they have some maps, and I notice Holyoke is in blue, the only community in the entire commonwealth that has an elected treasurer left, solely. The city of Holyoke is the only community, oh. yes, in the entire commonwealth. I printed it out. Chickabee's not elected? Right here. Uh, if it's combined treasurer collector, it's one thing. Oh, but okay. standalone treasurer, Holyoke, is the only community left. Um, and I know that when I was interviewed for this appointment, I, I said that I would, I hoped uh, that we would move in that direction. I'd be happy to step aside once that happened, and you know, I'd be the last uh, elected treasurer in the in the city of Holyoke. I did not know at the time that I was actually hoping to be the last elected treasurer of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, <laughs> uh, municipal treasurer. But I stand, uh, sit here before you requesting, please move forward on this, uh, because I, I think it speaks to your, your larger question, Councillor Vacan, which is why would we be doing something to, to move in one direction when we were really trying to consolidate? We need to consolidate operations. Right now, if you take the two base functions, or really there's three base functions in the, in the treasurer's office, we have the uh, cash management, right? The cash receipts coming in and managing the bank accounts. That is very important. It's something that really hasn't uh, had a, a large focus in, in a while. Um, that's something that we need to focus in on. But separate from that, um, the two other main functions have to do with uh, payroll uh, processing um, and at a certain point benefits administration and then uh, collecting back taxes uh, and the tax title process. And what's been really great about the two offices being physically uh, connected um, is that level of not just camaraderie, but also um, being able to work with each other, work the two offices being able to work with one another um, to answer questions, to come up with new processes. You know, uh, for example, um, prior to, you know, maybe six months ago, there were four or five different tax compliance sign off forms, and they came in in different formats and different ways to sign off and are you in a payment plan are you not in a payment plan and so the collector uh, Laura uh, you know said enough's enough let's come up with one uniform process she was able to walk right over we talked about it um, and and we were able to just make that happen there's probably not a day that goes by that we're not constantly talking with one another or her staff and my staff aren't talking with one another about <coughs> how do we make things better um, so this position uh, specifically uh, has been around as part of the union contract for at least um, eight years, maybe nine years, um, the floating positions. I don't know that they've ever fully been realized what, what we've wanted. You, you heard the assessor talk about it, how there's not really a lot of floating going on. The, the floating clerk that I currently have right now, in a pinch, will absolutely go over and work the counter uh, in the tax collector's office if there's no one available, but she's not fully trained uh, to do all the things that happen in that office, and that is something that should be happening. Um, and what we're talking about is somebody that would be uh, there that can do all of the front counter operations, not being sucked into personal property issues, uh, as it relates to the tax, the collection of taxes, or sucked into processing AP checks for the school department or payroll issues, which is what happens now. This would be so, somebody dedicated uh, to that functionality. So, if just to follow up, yeah. what I, where I'm losing the thread here is how that is helping how this position as opposed to the other position is going to help with the cross knowledge and the cross communication i get it that yep. you folks are communicating and 
that's great. But I mean, in terms of operationalizing it, so we I'm just having actually, a hard time seeing how this yep. has more cross work going on. It looks like less. Yep. So what we would be doing is we would actually be, and this is something we can do now without the larger municipal building project that's underway. Mm -hmm. um, we would actually uh, change the flow of public the way the public flows in right now. So okay. rather than there being two separate counters that folks would go to for tax related issues, there would be one counter. So consolidate. Exactly. Okay. And we would need this position in order to do that. Okay. Thank you. Councilor McGovern. Thank you, Mr. President. And Rory, thank you. Um, one of the reasons I like to talk about the recap sheet before we get into the line items of a budget is knowing where the projected revenues are coming from and what the budget is based on. Because especially when you talk about supplemental budgets, which are the mayor's prerogative up until the tax rate is set, you know, we, we do need to know is the money there. There, there appears to be in, in the levy limit, you know, the, that there is some flexibility for Mayor Gar Garcia to work with up until the uh, setting of the actual tax rate itself. But the reason I, I like to know is because of, of situations like this. We, for, first of all, we, we've not funded the deputy treasurer, I think, in close to a decade. I'm not 100% sure about that. But can you just give us the job description for deputy treasurer? Yeah, sure. So uh, really, it's, it's everything I just uh, discussed as far as uh, somebody, the, the deputy treasurer, um, it's a union position. Um, and they would be dealing with payroll, uh, accounts payable, uh, the processing of checks, dealing with the banking side of those transactions. As we move further and further along um, with modern banking, um, our, our bank of, of choice right now, Peoples, um, you know, is, is upgrading its system. So making sure that the vendor names, the vendor files, uh, the ACH files are all being produced um, in accordance with what their needs are uh, to ensure that the uh, payments are, are actually going out and that the checks, when they're made good, are made good to the right um, vendor. Uh, this is something that People's Bank is, is instituting across the board uh, and something that we're working on with our school department and at the city. So right now, our floating clerk does a lot of those things, um, but it does not, uh, the floating job description does not encapsulate all of the other duties that she has taken on. Um, and so I, I even, I said to the mayor and, and to the auditor that I'd like to move them into this position with that understanding that they've taken on so much more um, I, I believe I sat before the council a while back and talked about payroll functions. Um, up until this past year, there was really only one person in the office that could handle all of the payroll. Um, the current floating clerk has been trained um, and it is able to take on a lot of that responsibility and really should be elevated into a position that reflects that uh, additional duties that they've taken on. Um, so that, you know, if there was gonna be no increase to the total number of FTEs in the office that I'd really prefer to see the deputy treasurer position be fully funded um, so that they could be elevated into that uh, role that reflects the duties they've taken on. In understood, payroll is important and the uh, responsibility of your office towards payroll is mm -hmm. extremely important in, in many ways. And um, I, we, I think I, I get it. I think we all get it. But it, it is coupled with the responsibility of reconciling cash flow, yep. which, as you know, is still deficient. You inherited the yes. issue, and we commend you for the work you've done towards it. But are we still three to four months behind? We're not three to four months behind. Um, we're, we've, what happens is we've handed it, it, it all over, and it's taken a long time for us to get it to the auditor. And so now the auditor's office, and I can't uh, speak any higher about 
uh, the accountant. Well, Tanya, of course, knows what I think of her and, and, and how highly I think of her, but the raise she was talking about in her office, I've said, take it from my salary, change the ordinance and give it to, uh, to the person in her office who's doing that because uh, she's taken on so much and there's a lot of cross-training happening there. But the good news is where we're at right now is we've handed everything over through the end of April. Um, they're processing it on their end. We're well into May. Um, and with some of the larger accounts as it relates to wastewater treatment, um, the enterprise fund, we have a good plan in place to be able to post those receipts um, at month end, which is tomorrow, um, within a week. So I, I would say we've really caught up, um, but that isn't to say that we're out of the woods. We're, we're going to be taking a deep dive, and I think you know this, into the wastewater treatment plant, both budget and uh, and uh, and revenue, you know, especially mm -hmm. uh, on June seventh. Uh, part of that is to explore what the impact of a deficit in the wastewater treatment plant could have on this budget if steps aren't taken in terms of uh, reconciling the uh, difference in revenue and the expenses and certainly justifying the expenses as part of that. So I, uh, those figures by June 7th would be extremely helpful to this Absolutely. council. Yeah, we have a plan in place mm -hmm. to get them to you. And I and I understand, and Councilor Jernane, you know, made the point, I'm not gonna, you know, rehash it, but your, your, your budget, overall budget, looks like it's down $26,000, but when you look at the creation of a, of a new position, a new body, if not a new position, maybe not to be the correct way to uh, describe it, um, your, your budget is up if a supplemental budget comes in, and, and you need those dollars for a land court. There's, there's no question there. You, you, you did request $10,000 for a line item I never heard of. For, can you explain that? Yeah, so that is for tax possession property costs. And so that is, uh, it's, it's actually not new to the budget. That, that's a line that has existed, although I don't know when it's been funded. But the idea there is that once we um, both uh, put a property into lien, uh, depending on the circumstances, um, I'll, I'll use a real-world example, uh, 141 West Street, which we actually just took uh, through land court. Um, that is a small uh, parcel of land um, that has been in tax title for two decades. And there was a demo lien on it, so that inflated the costs of what the lien was uh, to well over $100,000. The parcel of land we're talking about is smaller than this office and the there is no owner right I mean the, the, there's nobody responding there's an owner of record but nobody you know whatever happened to them happened to them nobody was responding and so what we're left with is a property that's in flux the city's put a tax lien on it where it's working its way through the system but in the meantime it becomes a dumping ground um, for waste, um, our DPW, because of it being private property um, without having a license to enter, their ability to go on and take care of that um, is limited. And then once we actually take the property, as we just did, then it would go to our DPW to be able to clean it. So the idea here is that we would actually contract with somebody to maintain those properties, um, keep them free of debris. It's a lot easier uh, if the <coughs> folks in the neighborhood or those people that, that see that illegal dumping, dumping happening, um, see it being cleaned up not once a year, uh, going and taking three tons of garbage away at a $6,000 expense, uh, which is really what's happening right now, investing, having um, a contractor go out and make their rounds, that people will know that somebody's paying attention. Those properties won't fall into that state of disrepair um, that they currently fall into. And so that was the idea there. Even privately owned and getting off the track a little bit, yeah. um, that work can still be performed by the DPW and the cost for that work can be assessed similar to a tax lien yes. for that property owner. Clean and lean. Even without an owner being known. But yeah but eventually, you know, it works out in the wash. Yep, yeah. yep. 
But I, I, my only question, I kind of ask if I don't hear it, and sometimes I hear it without asking, is if this budget were to pass as is, can you um, perform the duties of your office uh, efficiently for the next fiscal year? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, seeing no one online. Uh, next is page eight, which would be the tax collector. I only had a small one, Mr. Oh, President. Councilor Jordan. It was, um, I saw in-state travel went up from uh, 200 to 1,100. Could you just kind of go over that for us? Yeah, between that and um, education and training, those two lines, uh, they were looking to have me attend more trainings, uh, the Mass Municipal Association training that I didn't get to go to right. uh, this year, as well as the Tax Collectors Association um, training that is, or uh, conference that is in June. And then they have two or three other uh, one day trainings that are generally out closer to Boston than they are here. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else for the collector? Councilor McGivern? Laura, just the same question. Um, I mean, outside of the salaries that you, you requested, and I respect that, um, your budget is pretty much. Uh, level funded up a thousand dollars a little bit more um you have if this budget were to pass would you be able to efficiently run your office or do you see deficiencies that maybe needed to uh be addressed with a supplemental budget um as of right now i am comfortable with the budget i will make note that i'm getting ready to do my third round of tax takings um, and this one is extremely aggressive. It's happening um, in about two weeks. And as of right now, we have 799 unpaid parcels. So assuming there isn't like a large uh, payment moving forward, I might need some more money to record these, but I don't foresee um, it being anywhere close to almost 800 parcels. So we should be okay. Thank you, and, and thank you for your aggressive approach. It's it's starting to show, paying off in uh, in short term, but but certainly it will be long term dividends as we go forward. Thank you. Anyone further? Seeing none, uh, that would end it for that portion. The last one on the agenda is the police department. Could, so could we do the cherry sheet though before with the yep. auditor and? If she has it. I Since we're sort of on the revenue side. Um, okay. So I'll turn that over to Tanya for that update. And everyone else, thank you. Thank you. Um, one point, uh, like Councillor Jenny Rivera is here. Councillor uh, Izzy Rivera is online hey, for attendance. But if there are follow-up questions, please contact <laughs> the department head. Because I know sometimes there's last-minute uh, things that come in before the final vote. That is funny. Do we have a schedule for the final vote? 26th. <laughs> I'd love to see all department here here with us that evening. So we have a meeting the 12th and the 13th for the rest of the departments, and then uh, the 26th is the final meeting. That's going to be a separate special meeting, right? Yeah, that's how it has to be. Okay. So with that, Tanya? Okay, I think um, everyone has a copy of the tax recap, except for maybe I didn't, but apologize about that. So if you look on page one of the recap, we are using the um, Senate Ways and Means cherry sheet figures. Those are the last ones that have came out. They actually came out, I want to say, the day or the day before that we um, we submitted the budget so you can see the total amount to be raised that's all of the money that we have to raise in the city is a hundred and eighty six million eight hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars we do have some receipts from other revenue sources uh, one hundred and twenty four million seventy five thousand 
and our levy for 2024 will be 62 million seven seventy five two forty seven. And if you're looking at your um, at your sheet, we're going through the estimated levy limit. So we start off with the 2023 base, which was 60, 61 million, and the 2023 adjusted new growth, 437,000. And I did ask Deb to stay if anybody had any um, questions regarding the assessment figures. And you add those together, you do the 2.5% of the growth that's allowed from the state. Um, and then you come to your levy limit plus exclusions. And this is where you're going to see if you have a surplus or deficit in your, um, in your budget. So you use the lesser of the, lev the levy limit or the ceiling, which in this particular case is the limit of the 63 million. And we do have a surplus right now in our budget of $1,223,000. And that is leaving $1.6 million on the table that we are not taxing for. I don't know how much you want me to go over the subsequent pages, but I will highlight some things on um, pages two through four. And that is, um, you can see, we have our state figures, figures on the second page. We have our cherry sheet charges. And we also have our cherry sheet receipts. Those come from the state. A lot of those receipts and charges do belong to the Holyoke Public Schools. And at the back of the tax recap form, I also put the cherry sheet. If you wanted to um, look at the figures and the way that they stand from the Senate um, today. Um, we do have, uh, let's see, I don't really know what else is, is super important on here because this is just tying all into the, to the front page. If you go to page three, you will see what our local receipts are. You won't see any actual seat receipts for 2023 because 2023 is obviously not closed yet. But the estimated local fiscal year 2024 receipts is $11.1 .1 million. That's only up about 3% from um, last year. It's not significant. I do think it's very realistic and conservative. On page four, you're going to see just your budgets are there right now. I will add some other things on as we close out fiscal year um, 2023. You're gonna see the 72, the 72 million is the departments, that's the city budget, and then the 91 million is the Holyoke Public Schools um, budget as a part of their net school spending. Is there any questions? Nope. I have Councilor questions. McGivern. The only thing I haven't heard is this year's free cash certified. It is not certified, but we are working on that today, and we should have it by the end of the week. Do we have a number? Um, no. Don't. I have to ask every don't year, you know. It. Don't say it. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what the number is. <laughs> we often joke around about that, but. Thank you, Councilor. Jordan. You're welcome. Yep. Um, Tanya or Mayor, I see that this would be a pretty dramatic increase to the levy of about four and a half percent over the current year. Are we prepared for that kind of a tax increase? Um, so right now the, the budget in front of you does reflect about a four and a half percent, but keep in mind that we budgeted much more conservatively than what we actually think we're gonna collect. So the, that four and a half percent can you know, be two and a half or three percent or whatever. I, last year, before we set the tax rate, we were able to get it down to one point eight percent. It's still hard to, to to tell, which is why I, I'm doing this exercise. Um, we're keeping keep an eye on that number and making sure that that I'm stretching these departments as as much as we can to be sure that if we are going to do a tax increase, that they're modest, not dramatic um not four so, and a half percent i knew you were gonna <laughs> i knew you were gonna bring it up uh, hey that's uh, what i'm here for you know as four and a half, I, I i had five percent in my mind i'm happy to know that it's now at four and a half percent um, <laughs> but it's artificial right now to say okay. um, unless something drastically happens in the next few short months you know it's it's my my hope that that that'll that 
you know, it's going to be much, much different as we get closer. So. If you had your hope, it wouldn't be 2.7, but it would be like last year we went up a million dollars on the levy. So this year, are you thinking comparable? It's like, like, like if you had a magic wand and this was your goal, what are you shooting for? My goal is no percent. Oh, lovely. <laughs> All right. We got the same goal. Uh, you know, and, and oftentimes we debate that and how realistic that that might be. Um, but also we do have economic, we, we do have circumstantial pressures up against us that is going to force us to continue to evaluate and try to pivot our position um, as much as we're able. Um, but, you know, working together with the auditor, um, who is very good um, at this exercise, um, you know, we're taking it, we're, we're, what we're trying to do is pump the brakes a bit so we can pace ourselves through the storm, um, opposed to just swallowing the whole 1.3 million on the table and taxing to the levy limit, which I think is what we used to do. But you know, to the defense of the past, circumstantial the situation was different at that time. Today's position is better than we were, so it gives us that flexibility mm. to um, uh, you know to to think creatively and plan and 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 make those pivots when we need to. Um, and then it doesn't also include any like. The 1.7 million, you know, when the Bay State Hospital, like, there's other new growth, right? That is not that we're not even, that's not even in that reven that estimated revenue projection that's in front of you, right? Right. So, as as much as we can keep that down, I really hope we will do that because I'm sure, like other counselors here, I I do hear from constituents about. Um, keeping body and soul together on the taxes, and it's you know, with everything else that just keeps going up and up and at the grocery store and at every facet of life, it just seems people are pulling them in every direction possible. If we can stay out of their wallet, it would really be, it would really be appreciated, especially if there's these things that are being considered now about maybe another round of sewer rate increases um, the water department just did a, a pretty substantial water rate increase, and um, you know that that would be really appreciated. So, um, you know, I, I would certainly like to see a number, you know, closer to that sixty million number as as much as we as we could. Um, and I, I would certainly encourage you to to do what you can to do that. And, and I know I'm sure you want to do that. Um, how come, and actually this is more of a Tanya question, on page two of the estimated local receipts, how come there's not a placeholder in here for the enterprise funds and the CPA for now in here? Like, for example, last year it was 20 million. Now we have it in here as 11 million. Um, we pretty much know, right, that the enterprise fund has some, right now it's budgeted at zero, that's the sewer fund. And CPA, we typically know it's around 700 and change. Um, do you think we should put a placeholder here? And if we did, what impact does that have on the front page numbers? Because obviously we had a huge increase in state receipts according to this. Um, this was budgeted at 105 last year, a million. And this is saying your estimate is 112.9. So that's a very positive um, number. Um, but we have nothing on here for sewer and CPA. So the reason why there's nothing on there for sewer and CPA is the CPA usually ties out to zero. Their revenues and their expenses usually equal out, so it has zero impact. But for the sewer, last year I know that we voted on $25,000, but our revenues have gone up a little bit from previous year's um, collections. So I am going to add that on there, but I'm, I'm waiting to see what the real revenues look like before I put a number in that's gonna decrease the surplus at this moment. I've also had conversations with the state and we are working on the sewer rate as well. So I was kinda gonna see how that pans out before I put a $700,000 deficit in there and, and impact these figures. But I will be doing that soon. Just so I understand, um, 
I was under the impression in this section three, we put total receipts here so that if we are taking in CPA funds and to that, like for example, on last year's sheet, we had 783.808 on that line last year. And I was just wondering why that number wouldn't have appeared this year on there. Are you ta you're talking about where it has the budget appropriations on the back sheet, page four? Um, yeah, I'm looking at <clears throat> section three, estimated receipts and other revenue sources, subsection B, estimated receipts, local, line four. Mm -hmm. So those come from the back page, and okay. that's where they equal out. So they're budgeted on the back page, page four. Okay. You can see the... Um, Enterprise fund in E, in the CPA also goes in that section E. So it goes under here as budgeted, but then it also goes on the second page as a receipt, so it can net out to zero, or it can net out to a deficit or a surplus, either, either way that it works. Okay, so you put them as zero on both? Is that why you... I just did not... I didn't enter anything yet because okay. I knew they're netting to zero and I knew it wouldn't have an impact on the bottom line budget because if I was to put... If I was to put the sewer budget in here, I would also put the sewer revenue that would equal the same figure. Same with the CPA. So there's a page on the back for the expense and then the revenue also would go here or on the second page or if you were to have a you know, any type of a write-off that would be found on the second page. Total estimated. Hmm. See where it says, uh, like, snow and ice deficit on page two under um, number B? Uh, this is on, on section B, yeah. Mm -hmm. Section B, page two. Yeah. If you go under there, you can see like the snow and ice deficit is number nine, 10 other fund deficits. If there was a deficit, that would show up there. The CPA for the estimated receipts would show up in um, section three. And also you're gonna see the enterprise run fund receipts under section three, number B3. So oh. you would have a revenue on page two, and you would have also have your expenses in there at the same time. They're kept separate when you're, re when you're uh, filling out your state forms as well. Okay, because I guess maybe it's just a little bit different than what I was used to. Um, because when I was going back, if you go back to page one, right, you have line... So 1A says the 186,850 number, right? And that ties to the 186,850 number that's on page two. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. So then B goes to B, yep. right? So to line E. So those two tie out. But what I'm saying is that 124,075 number. Yep. There's no receipts for sewer and there's no receipts for CPA, but there's also no expenses for sewer and no expenses for CPA. I see. So they're what, not going to they're not going to transfer onto the first page unless there's a deficit. So uh, so what you're doing then is you're reducing line A mm -hmm. and reducing line B. That's correct. Okay, but if we were to show full expense and full revenue, then a would be higher and B would be higher, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I guess I would because I was trying to do an apples to apples comparison to Sorry. last year's sheet. That was that was why. Understood. Oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, let me see. I just had. Let's go clarifying. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, can. Yep. I just want to ask a clarifying question before I forget with all these details. So if I'm under following all these questions and answers, it indicates that we don't have a deficit in either the sewer fund or the CPA fund. Is that accurate? At this moment, yes. Thank you. Okay. And we won't know those until some point in the future? I want to say we already know we are going to have a sewer deficit because of Veolia and some of the things that have gone on with the pipes and we're working with the state right now and also 
is it uh, Abrams, is that his name? Mark Abrams, yeah. And we're, we're looking at that, we're looking at the rates and we're trying to figure out now like, do we need to cover that on the recap? Is that something that we can cover if we increase our sewer rates? So that's something that we're looking at right now, which is why I didn't I didn't want to put it in there without actually everybody having that discussion. Okay. But you are anticipating. I am anticipating a deficit. Yes, unless previous year's collections are more than I I'm thinking. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Councilman. But the the deficit is looks like it's more based on the budget proposal than on what's going on right now and budgets can be cut. Say it the sewer budget. Mm hmm Well I I won't be cutting that budget if that's what you're asking. Is that what you're asking me or that's what I'm suggesting. To cut the sewer budget? Sure. <laughs> it, it, it came in with a conservative, you know, estimated budget. We we need to look at it as much as we look at the revenues coming in. I think they, um, they need to justify expenses. So that's what Mark Abrams, again, to the support of this body, and I'm no technical expert when it comes to that world. And so I think we're going to learn a lot when, when Mark comes in front of the council and, and presents um, his analysis and recommendations for the city. June 7th. June 7th. Anyone further? No one online. Okay, so with that, we can turn over to page 19, 2021. This is the police department. The chief is here. Was there any? I was just curious, just by way, if the chief maybe had some opening remarks or any major changes to this year's budget or any overarching things you wanted to tell us about or new initiatives. Chief, welcome. I don't know if you're waiting for me. Chief. If you want to say something or you want me to say something. You want me to, uh, so the, the only, before chief dives in and talks about positions and personnels, and I think there were some additional adjustments after I presented my pros budget and we'll talk about that. Um, but the biggest one right now, currently the line item was like 200 plus for the vehicles. It was our second payment toward the vehicles. Remember we had that lengthy conversation about yes. it. Yep. So my strat my strategy was just so you're aware. Um, and I didn't anticipate free cash to take this long to be certified, but again, keeping an eye on that rate. I was treating it as a capital and looking forward to present a number of things to invest our free cash. One of them was to make this next payment in the new fiscal year. So you'll notice in the line item um, that the chief did propose, what was it, 200 and, I don't know, 40,000, I think. 200, 250, 250 uh, plus thousand for that second payment, I cut it in anticipation of making that payment using an alternative uh, source, again, um, the exercise that I keep referring to. Not my favorite thing to do, um, but you know, we're trying to be as creative as possible. Okay. Um, but other than that, Chief can go through and talk about numbers of officers, captains, and um, things he's trying to achieve within the department. Okay, so the mayor covered the cruisers. That that was the big one uh, for me. Just to, in, you know, I'm comfortable with the mayor's plan, and, and you know, the at the end of the day, it's just about getting the cars, and it doesn't really matter which way we do it, as long as we, you know, we make that second payment so we can take uh, control of those cruisers. As far as personnel, um, what I did was I I just kind of um, I, I really uh, leaned on the uh, audit. That we all wanted and you know look to hopefully increase our number of officers um, in, in conjunction with the mayor um, we looked at what the, and the, it's exactly what the audit said uh, uh, you know the, their numbers are 17 to 30 but not realistic to do in one year to do small incremental in, increases and and that's what we did we added three um, <coughs> officers to the to the total um, 
I think it's imperative for the things that the audit wants us to accomplish. The underlying theme in that audit is that it, staffing is, a, is an issue, and if we do not address that, then it's, it's hard to address anything else. Um, so um, that was the main change was in the uh, patrolman's line item. Other than that, um, things are the changes that you see are mainly contractual or um, you know I'm, I'm ready to answer on any one line. Um, there was some additional things put in that we were looking at a crime analyst, which this seems to be a big topic. Everybody wants me to have one. I want to have one. It'd be great. Um, and we were looking to uh, civilianize the grant manager position and, and, and actually um, creatively we were, we were going to combine that with, uh, with a public information officer. Um, we had a, uh, I know we put the money in there last year. We, we were not able to fill that. We had a, a strong candidate that we were set to hire and, and that candidate had some um, last minute sort of personal issues I won't get into, but it, it's caused him to delay accepting the position. So um, I guess if there's good news, that 55,000 is coming back. Um, but you know, the, the hope is to move forward with that. And, and again, <coughs> along with what the audit was asking us to do was to civilianize positions. This would be almost like a two for one and um, allow me to free up officers to do police work. Um, so those are, those are like the main changes that I can think of off the top of my head. But again, if you have any questions, I'm ready. Sure. Uh, mayor's mayor's going to oh, okay. So I, I, I don't know if, I think it went through your, your, your channels, but there was a, a, a correction on the version of the budget that's in front of you. Um, so chief had put in for four captains because we have four paid mm -hmm. captains at the moment. Yep. I had cut it down to three. Um, and then it was one of those, assuming one was, I think there's like two that are getting ready to retire, but they're in those positions and we shouldn't be cutting them until something actually happens. So I, I, I put that back. Also, if you look at the, uh, the patrol officer position, the, the, this number of employees right there is, I think is throwing people off, but the number that was proposed there um, by the chief is actually for 98 officers, right? Chief 98 we learn later. And so the new number right. which Tanya has cuts it down to 95 because we our, our goal for for that we've been working on this whole time is to hit that 94 mark, which I believe we hit. There's a handful of them in the academy right now. So 94 is the sweet spot that we want to stay stay at. Um, but again, just as for the figures in front of you so it's clear and you guys know what you're looking at, that the chief's numbers is actually 98. I wanted the 95, and then the captain position should reflect the chief's number, which is the 48.7, um, to support the the four captains opposed to my proposed three. So the 92 should be 95. So it in so our budget book. Correct. His his number would be 98. My number yep. would be 95. Okay. Which Tanya I think has um, just hmm. your your dollar amounts are the same. Right. Uh, it doesn't reflect what you're saying. Not on, not on mine, but maybe in our budget, make it through. It's the same same amount. We have six four six eight seven zero seven. I sent those over. The, it it should be um, six million three eighty nine three six eight six three eight nine for ninety eight for ninety five for ninety five. Right. Can you give us that number again, Chief? Six three six million three hundred and eighty nine thousand three hundred and sixty eight. Okay. And that gives ninety five officers. 95. Correct. Okay. So, Ms. Councilor Bacon. So I just wanted to follow up. I know you were very optimistic about the class coming through and having you up to level. Is that looking like it will actually happen as things are progressing? Um, yes, we're, we lost one in the academy, but we still have nine in there that are all doing very well. I think we'll, you know, we'll be right there. Um, I think at that point we were shooting for, you know, obviously 92, so we could potentially be at 91. 
we are looking already because it's just the way you have to do it. you have to be way ahead of this curve there is an academy in the fall um, so we believe we can make up the shortages there there's also a potential that one or two of the candidates that we could potentially be looking at for the fall already have the academy mm -hmm. so that if we were able to hire them they would start right away so that would be that's also a, a huge cost savings to the city um, so I, you know I can't guarantee they'll take the job or they would but you know I think at least one of them would certainly if we if we were able to, to achieve that um, it's always a quite the process with civil service to secure the list to get the people in the uh, the demand is you know there but the uh, supply is is not these days um, the lists come in with many many names and very very few come in and actually sign the list to take the job um, so it, it's there's a new test that was given I, I believe this spring so we are hoping to have a fresh set of names um, to, to work off of shortly as well going into the fall so um, when that list gets certified that'll certainly help but I think um, I, I'm very very optimistic we just had seven officers that were in our sort of field training program and they have cleared that and they're on the street now and we're, we're seeing increases I'm, I'm noticing uh, on our our daily rosters you know more opportunities to assign a traffic officer to assign um, what we call a special detail which can be um, a hotspot detail or, or some pressing uh, problem of the day and, and when we get this group out they should graduate right around Labor Day and then they'd be in training and we anticipate having them fully up and operational by probably uh, mid-October early November so by that time, um, I'm extremely optimistic of the, the numbers we'll have to be able to, to, to meet the needs and to address what I know everyone's been asking for is, is more traffic enforcement. So that, that's the goal. I think we're on track. I, I think that, um, you know, I think, you know, just, just having the audit to follow along and, and, and look at those recommendations um, I think has been helpful, and I think we're, we're headed in the right direction. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Yeah, great. Thank you, Chief. So um, obviously this is a big investment for the city. Last year we budgeted the $5.7 million. This would be going up to almost $6.4 million, so that's a 700000 increase. That's obviously a big percentage in this line. Some now, of that would be from the raises as well, though. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Not just the increase. And it should be noted we did give raises. So that was yes. important for the officers, too. So, um, you know, we were able to do that, and I'm glad we did do that. Um, last year we had 92 positions. Now we're talking about going to 95 positions. So that's plus three, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So. <clears throat> And, I, and you hit one of my magic words, which I loved, it's music to my ears, is the traffic enforcement and having it. So is this to say that we can report, if we get these extra three officers on the books, that we're going to have our traffic bureau and we're going to be giving out the, the speeding tickets and the loud music tickets and the you know people not parked where they're supposed to be and you know you you name it around um you know whether you're in front of a hydrant or or you know all that type of quality of life stuff that i know all of us as counselors get um you know what what do you what do you think is is that the goal with the extra three officers is to to create that again i i think that um as i see it and the best way to do that um is to increase our staffing, which allows us, I think the increase in staffing is twofold, to take care of issues that you're talking about, traffic, other issues, quality of life issues that come up. And also, I know it's, you know, to address the overtime as well, which is also right. mentioned in the audit pretty right. strongly. Yep. Um, and so obviously with the increased staffing, I don't see, you know, respectfully, I don't think a traffic bureau separate from everything else is the answer. I think designating 
traffic officers on shift okay. that can be used multi-purpose is probably the best way to go. Okay. And, and ideally, what, what that would look like would be pretty much an officer in each group is an, as a traffic officer. In theory, you'd have two in every night. And then depending on manning, we, we would be able to utilize those officers. So let's just say in the course of a, a you know, a, a two week work cycle, uh, you know, out of 10 work days, eight of them would be on traffic and maybe because of shortages or, you know, right. sh you know, whatever happens, they might not get to traffic a couple of days, but we're already increasing the amount of traffic and this will just increase it more. And I think that's a, a better way to utilize this. I already have um, a couple supervisors assigned to sort of oversee it all and in conjunction with the traffic grants, which I'm sure you've seen some of that going on. Um, also the collaboration we're doing with the state police to help us with some of the more complex issues like the, the tractor trailers and the, and the yep. J brakes and all that. We, yep. we, we have those partnerships going as well. So the goal is just to increase traffic um, and yet still support our patrol division. So okay. I think this is twofold. I think it's the way to go. And I think certainly, you know, short of, that's why I didn't in the, I didn't want to line item it out as six more officers for traffic. I don't think that, yes, you could stick them in their own little unit and they could do traffic and that was it. But again, I, I think in today's world, we're all doing more with less. And I think it's important to multitask people mm -hmm. and, and to make sure that we're, we're hitting all the fronts. So that's my plan anyway, as, as we increase. Um, I think that the audit was clear about the increases. I think that maybe the audit, in, in fairness, I'll say they might have overshot a little bit. I like the idea of incrementally adding and, and it'll give us all a chance to see, all right, what does 95 officers look like? Everybody happy with that? Maybe, you know, because it yeah. did mention that the public has to decide in the, in, the, in the council, as together we have to decide how much do we really want to increase? What is it, when is enough enough? And, and I think the best way to see that is incrementally, and we'll see next year. I think by the fall, you're gonna see a huge difference. We'll see next year, I'll come back and, you know, course I'll ask for three more and you can decide then do we need three more or do we not need three more Slow down. And, and I might not you know <laughs> Slow down. I don't want to get too far ahead you know but uh no but I I think that it, it gives us a good view and maybe in, in fairness we'll say maybe three was too much maybe we need only two more maybe we only need one more and we can come to that realization and you'll see I think you're going to see this fall a big difference in, in what we've been able to put out there as opposed to what's coming this fall. I'm excited about the fall. I think the department is excited about the fall. I think we've been striving to get here. It's taken us almost two years to get where we're at. So um, it's not an easy process, but as long as we stay on top of it, and I think we have good things in place now to make sure that happens, I, th I think we're, we're gonna see that. And I think you're, you know, I don't know, Jumping way ahead, but I'd like to say next year you're going to see a decrease in the overtime as well. Good. Well, we appreciate it, and I think everybody is unified here on this council on the point about the traffic and how you do it. And, you know, we're not here to micromanage you how you set it up, but getting it done, making it a priority. I mean, we get all these type of questions and concerns uh, from you know, from constituents who are very frustrated about their neighborhoods and protecting their neighborhoods and quality of life issues and and that that presence is going to be super super important to have so that that's great to hear that you incorporated that in and greatly appreciate it i'd like to come back to the the grant manager and the crime analyst and and not seeing that funded again and i was under the impression that what do we need is there something is there a disconnect here why this doesn't continue to get funded what's the disconnect it seems that we feel that civilian positions should be done by civilians. We don't, with all due respect, you know, we don't want people making $250,000 in a grant manager type of position that could be done by a civilian for, you know, potentially a third of that amount. And getting those type of resources, somebody who's really a, a pro in there and, um, and then as far as the crime analyst, this is someone who's there to support us to do grants and things of this nature. 
how are we allocating resources correctly? We have a huge department, a large scope of responsibility, <coughs> and making sure that things are being deployed. And this is sort of operational intelligence to, to do these things. Um, why? What's the thinking as to why we this is continues to not be funded? Yep, and and I and we talk about it all the time, and we and I want to fund it. Um, referring back to the exercise, I didn't want to treat one department different than other departments. Like I didn't want to just say, okay, we'll add this one and cast and and try different here. Um, uh, so that that was just a level of consistency that. So, so I can maintain that that confidence and trust with all departments that there is a strategic method and behind the exercise. Um, we we tried with the uh, the grant. We we had someone on the hook. We lost it. I want to revisit it again. Just right now in this phase of the exercise, we just said, look, right, we want to pace ourselves. We'll revisit again once we get the update on revenues as we get closer to year end. So we could see that in the supplement. Um, potentially, depending on where things are and how it's a puzzle. So it, okay. if I if, if I can make the puzzle work the way I envisioned it, then absolutely. I I don't want to not add it in. I, I think it's critical. And I know the Police Relations uh, uh, Advisory Committee, is, we speak all the time about the crime analyst and how important that role is. Um, so, you know, again, I, I want to do it. It's just I'm trying to be consistent with the method. Explain to us then the method, Mayor. It, like what's going on behind the scenes that it sounds like, if I'm listening carefully, that you have all these different departments that are asking for additional resources yep. and this is part of some other master plan that's going on and the police have their request here. Like what's the pro? like what's going, is this crime analyst position has been talked about, I mean, at least five or six years. Well, right now the, the key focus for me is that CAFO Okay. And I think it's that CAFL that's going to help all these departments. It's going to help us, you know, collect uncollected revenue or, you know, really help us reach our un untapped potential. Okay. Those are resources on the table that can benefit these groups. We've been, you know, um, there's been certain liabilities we've been responding to that are expensive. Those are resources we could have kept to support these departments. So... You know, I can't. I couldn't accomplish all my goals in year one, or I don't think I can accomplish all of them in year two. But what what I hope to do is is uh, over time is incremental progress um, during my term here. Um, so it's 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 trying to make sense of all the needs and then pacing ourselves in a way that helps achieve that 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 helps build those um, in those cap capacities in the department, but not in a way. But in a way, that's going to help us also navigate other circumstances we're all dealing with, which is, which is you know, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to better manage the economic circumstances as far as managing our finances is concerned. Um, I think a CAFO will do a lot better of a job than me, but, to, you know, to answer your question, that's that's the thought process behind it. Okay. Um, I'll stop there. I have more questions, but I'll stop because others might have questions. Councillor Vacan. Thank you. This is more of a comment. This is um, constituent feedback and suggestion. Um, they believe, anecdotally, reports would indicate that if we more aggressively ticket the speeders and the people doing the infractions, that we'd probably be able to pay for one of the positions. Now, again, I haven't done the math, so I can't prove that. Um, but in looking at statistics, it looks like we could be potentially issuing more tickets, which would help the quality of life and also the bottom line. So I just share that as feedback I hear on a pretty regular basis from folks out in the community. Yeah, I just I just feel the need to say that we we can't do anything ticket wise with the idea of creating revenue. It's just well, I no, understand no, no. that it, no, no, it no. can, but it, right. that would not, not the, be involved not the in our no, planning no, no. phase of anything. <laughs> I, and I don't mean that to be construed as setting a goal right. 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 Oh, <laughs> of <it>. a number <laughs> at all. Yeah. Right. Anyone else for the chief this side? Councilor McGivern? Chief, I just, um, not, not to uh, repeat or rehash, but the the 98 versus 95, I'm you know, much more comfortable with 95 than 92, but I'd be comfortable with 98 
if you were to tell us it would reduce some of the overtime cost. But I think I heard you say overtime might, is going to be going up reports. despite additional police officers. No, no. I, I think overtime is where it's been. I think you're going to start to see a decrease in overtime based on already with the group we have coming out in the fall. With the additional officers, I'll put another class in in the fall, which will keep us at these, at, it actually increase us, which you'll see even more, but you won't see that. You don't see the effect until those people come out of the academy and, and hit the streets. So this group that would go in the academy, I believe they've set a date for late October for the fall academy, um, which means they wouldn't get out till you know the spring. But the, the group we have coming out at the end of the summer will hit the street in the fall. That is where you'll start to probably for the first time since we started two years ago building to where we are, where we'll start to see hopefully a decrease in the overtime okay. with the numbers. I, I, agree I with already you. said I that. I, just... you. I, I, could, I will say to you that if I had 98, yeah, you would probably see even more. But I think that, you know, in fairness, as, as much as I would love to say, yeah, give me 98, in, in talking with the mayor and in, in discussing it, I, I think going – going three at a time you know go slow and let's let's see where we're at we might be very happy at 95 i i, I think we'll see and, and we'll know that next spring going into next budget cycle um and and you know i won't ask for 98 if i don't think i need them there was a time when uh, and you did say that earlier i just took it a little different now i understand there was a time when 95 was a more of a magical number and, and worked um 98 was the uh you know the, the the ceiling, so to speak, but um, to me it I think makes there sense. There was a time when we were over a hundred, because I know when I came it was up in that range. So you're starting um, to show your longevity. I know, I know. I, I, <laughs> I'm sure. They Speaking of uh, longevity, do we have any? Do we have an idea of how many retirements might take place? Um, I didn't get that number, but I I. I I guess about it's a move. I know it's a move target. About, just you know, just off the top of my head, I'd say probably five officers or or patrolmen both, between both ranks between, between both between the yeah. uh, superior officers and the patrolmen. I would say probably five. And if I could, through the chair, just a quick question to the auditor, Tanya: an estimated receipts, the administrative fee that we charge for outside services that the police provide. Is that reflected in the recap sheet? Yes, they're under administrative fees. Page two or page? <clears throat> page, uh, I wanna say it's page three in the local receipts. You can see, let me see. Um, Fees, number 10, on page three. I see it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone further? Yeah, I had uh, some additional. Councilor Gurney. Everybody else has had a chance. Okay, great. Um, Chief, I wanted to ask you about um, motor vehicle fuel. I saw you had obviously requested a pretty substantial increase, yep. but on the same token, here it's put at 95,000. Do you, do you think that's sufficient when two years ago you spent 138,000? Um, so uh, the, I think the mayor will answer that. Okay. So yeah, two years ago, gas prices were crazy. Last year we got locked into <clears throat> a rate that we thought it was good because it was during that moment when the gas kept going up and up and up and then it dropped. Um, our procurement officer was able to get us a gas and diesel contract at a fixed rate at half the cost of what we were in this year. So that number is, we're still trying to figure out what the good number, target number is. So it's one of those where we might not have to revisit it at year end. We might have to revisit it at year end. So we're, Tanya and I have been, you know, obviously keeping a close eye and trying to understand where the level is so we can determine what an average what an appropriate average number would be to budget for mm -hmm. but that's what's been going on the last two years it's uh just the, trying to hit the target and 
again, when, when you see the procurement officer, and she's really been hitting a home run in a lot of angles, and you're going to hear about it when she's in front of you, but this is one of them. She secured a contract that brings gas and diesel half the cost than what we're paying for in this fiscal year. Okay. I wanted to ask you also, um, whoever wants to answer this, is about the auxiliary police. You know, they provide a tremendous service to the city and, um, you know, basically gr gratis. But I wanted to make sure that they're being, are they given the support in terms of doing their training or the different things that they need to do their work? And I'm just wondering why there's nothing in this budget for them. No, I believe there is. Um, okay, is it somewhere what, else? What or? happened was, um, just, just to clarify, um, Going back to the police reform bill, yep. auxiliary police were were discontinued. Right, it's right, like, and and no. so we had to um, we we reimagined them as traffic officers, and um, not traffic officers like you want, but tra right. uh, traffic officers, um, just the same. And 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 I believe there's a line item, and they were last year. Uh, I think what happened was um, some confusion that we had no auxiliary police, so we don't need the money. We ended up. Finding the money, it's a very small amount that we normally budget for. I believe it's six thousand, yeah. and that takes care of everything they need. Um, and um, they do a, like you said, a huge service for us. We we were able to salvage um, quite a quite a good amount of those people between the auxiliaries themselves. I believe when they were the auxiliary police, we had about seventy of them, and I think our current number is. 55 or 56 something like that and we took on as specials another 10 so we were able to salvage almost all of the auxiliaries in some capacity to help the police department and as you know i mean our biggest need is the parade and road race right but all the other events that they you know participate with um they still are able to do that so um there is a line i think we changed because um, I think it said something like auxiliary uh, police fire training or something, training. and we ch there's just a line that says auxiliary. Oh, right. I yep. see. So is this the auxiliary police first responder training six thousand? Right, and and so we changed it to auxiliary. Correct, Tanya? Is that is that yeah, right? It's auxiliary police first responder training. Yes. Yeah. And so um, it was put there. Okay. To be to be honest with you, I think it belongs in the other line item, the one that just says auxiliary. Because um, they might do other than training, right? That's right. Well, that's what if why they we had created, to buy something? Uh, I or? think we created that line that just says auxiliary. I think that's correct. i got to find it on my budget. I know I have it. Yeah, it's like fifty five eight sixty one is the old auxiliary line. Right. And then the, and then the line is, uh, yeah, 61. It yeah. just says auxiliary. Right, um, right. I, I, I believe that's where we put the money last year. I, I was a little, actually, but yeah. it, it's in one of them. I think I'll be here for a transfer for, from auxiliary okay. first responder okay. over to auxiliary. Um, but at least the money was there this year. Last year, we I, I can't remember exactly where we took it from to fund them, but we, we got them through last year, and, and um, you know, it's such – a small amount for the amount that they actually oh, provide us it's it's amazing it's, you know um and and i don't know how quite frankly they do it but they're they're very happy with that amount and yep. i'm happy to still have them because i don't know what i would do without them yeah exactly from um from the group of individuals that i had spoken to they had mentioned the six thousand number so i wanted to make sure they're getting at least six thousand earmarked for them because for us as a city to have that type of number of auxiliaries here, I think is an amazing credit to Holyoke, our civic engagement. Um, I would be hard pressed to believe, me. I mean, I'm, there's a lot of other wonderful cities out there, but that for our size to get 65 individuals to, to do what they do for basically nothing is just awesome. And they help out so many organizations, so many events. For us to give six grand to that is chump change for for what they what they do. So I want to make sure that we protect those funds uh, in, and in they, the budget. They've done a great yeah. job transitioning to the oh, new yeah. role. It's you know we're we're still getting pretty much the same service, right? And, and and at the end of the day, they just want to help. 
Exactly. And that's, and that's exactly. what's great about them. And, and you've been a great supporter of theirs, and that's appreciated absolutely. by a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Chief, for that. Because uh, they, they, you know, all they're most of the time looking for is respect. That's it. And, and, um, and they just give hours and hours and hours and hours back to the city for gratis. Uh, they're actually less paid than a city councilor. So, <laughs> uh, and we know how many hours we put in. So uh, yeah. uh, they, they, they're even extra special than, uh, than we are. So um, I, I did want to mention that. Um, I will just ask about the quickly, a quick question on the Quinn bill. I know there was a goal for quite a long time to try and get that trending down, and we were told that was going to kind of tr start trending down. I noticed that we're trending back up, but that's because of the more officers, correct? That right. plus a little bit of the pay right. raises. Right, I think the pay raises will bring that up, but I think with the retirements that will come, all the retirements that come now yep. are Quinnville people. Right. So that will right. continue to drop, Okay. and, and some of the bigger ones will be coming in so that number probably I would imagine the number we budget for we have to budget obviously for the full year right um and Chinese probably I don't have the exact numbers but I'm sure that line item comes back with money each year as the retirements come in okay um so I, I would anticipate the same thing this year now, um, to tie back to um, where Councilor McGivern had asked you about the five people retiring, we have three buyback lines that are basically about $675,000 combined. My, my right. question is, is that, that's just for those five folks? Is that, is like the time owed buyback, I'm assuming, is that for them too? Or is that some, is that, would that be for something else? Correct. That's, that's for, for the, the retirees. For retirees. Okay. So occasionally there's uh, smaller buyouts as well. Um, not so much from time owed, but from vacation or sick time. Maybe not sick time, but uh, mainly vacation when um, employees, probably like dispatchers and clerks or, or someone, Sure. Um, comes, works with us for a few years and then decides to move on and there's a small buyout, but those are usually relatively small. They're usually absorbed um, with what we currently already have. Um, we have unexpected, re you know, people that leave for whatever reason. Um, so those, it's, it's really a, a moving target all the time. We try to look at the people that are eligible to retire, um, have sort of indicated that they plan to retire um it's a it's a tricky thing i think that there's officers that think in their mind they want to retire until they get much closer to that date and and have a tendency to pull back um so we're always sort of dancing around that um number but i think that's another line item that usually ends up ultimately serve. coming back if they don't retire so, um, so we do our best to try to sure. pin it down, but it, it's, a, it's a moving number as well. Do you, now, obviously, if you took 675,000 divided by five people, I believe that's 135,000 each. It might be more than five. I might be off on that. Okay. It, it might, we, when we look at it, um, I, I'm trying to remember now how many we had exactly. Okay. Um, Take a look. We may have added an extra one okay. this year, six, six, based on some, you know, knowledge of people potentially leaving. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time tonight. Absolutely. No one further. No one online. All right. So that's all that we have for tonight's budget hearing. Um, Thank everyone who came in. Once again, if there are follow-up questions, you can always reach out to the department head. Um, and with that, we'll call this one to a close. Thank you, everyone. Oh, oh actually, Councilor Tallman did join us as well, so I just want to make sure we got him um, check, has checked in. All right. Have a good evening. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank okay. you.